you have a Bible, please join with me today in Matthew chapter 1. Matthew 1 this morning, we are in a Christmas series entitled, Why the Nativity? Last week we asked the question, why did Jesus, why did the eternal God become man? And ultimately, the answer is because God loves you and he wants to save you. This morning, my message is entitled, Why Joseph? Why Joseph? Why would God choose Joseph in a tiny little town that had a, well, a no good reputation? Why pick a man without a formal education? Why pick a man with very little money to be the father, the adopted father of the Son of God? Would you please stand with me in Matthew chapter 1? And we'll consider why Joseph. Matthew chapter 1, and we pick up the reading in verse 18. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise. When as his mother Mary was espoused to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man, and not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privately, privately. <coughs> but while he thought of these things... Behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. May we pray. Our Father, we are grateful to hold the Word of God in our hands and to understand how you demonstrated, how you, you proved your love for each one of us, not by just giving us life, but by offering the gift of eternal life to all who believe upon Christ. Now, Father, I pray that if there be one here today and they're just not certain if heaven's their home, God, give them spiritual understanding. Open up their spiritual eyes. Give them spiritual ears to hear your truth about your plan of salvation for their hearts and lives. For those watching online, open up hearts that may not be saved as well. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. It seems today that the goal of many young people is to someday become famous. What is it to become famous? Well, famous people have millions of followers that follow them on social media. Uh, famous people have lots of money. Uh, famous people have their pictures on, on magazine covers uh, or on cereal boxes. In Joseph's day, Jewish men did not desire prestige but rather a good reputation. And so God is going to use Joseph, someone who is not famous, someone who is just an ordinary man, to accomplish something extraordinary. We learn through his story that when we trust and when we obey God, he mysteriously unfolds his plan for us, and in this case, the plan for the whole world. There in your notes, Joseph is the forgotten man of Christmas. He is the man God chose to be the adopted father of our Lord, the one who would protect the infant Savior of the world. Joseph stands silent. He is spoken to, he is spoken about, but not a single syllable crosses his lips. According to Matthew's genealogy, Joseph was a man of royal blood. He appears on the scene for a moment, then he disappears. Uh, judging from Mary's sacrifice of the two turtle doves there in the temple in Jerusalem, we may assume that he was on the poorer side, uh, maybe middle class, Luke 2, 24. He's a carpenter. He's a simple man. He's a practical man. He, he, he would love the feel of wood and stone, the satisfaction of building something useful, building something out of nothing. We can imagine that like Mary, he envisioned an ordinary life, an orderly life. He would, he would work hard and, and he would have a good reputation and he would attend the synagogue services and, and he would marry and have a family and teach his children his trade. 
Matthew 1, 18. This is speaking about the betrothal. Mary is espoused to Joseph. I'd like you to, to notice the, the three steps to a Jewish marriage and how accurate the Bible is. Three steps to a Jewish marriage. First of all is the engagement step. Uh, this is nothing more than the mom and dad of the girl and the mom and dad of the boy sitting down and saying, I think this might be a good marriage, and they write a contract and they sign it. I want you to know that this is based on tradition and not on the Bible. Though I've met a lot of parents who, when their kids are about three or four, think, hey, let's get together and let's kind of work this out. We're going to go ahead and plan out our, our kids and who they're going to marry. Aren't you glad that doesn't happen today? Based on tradition, not on the Bible. The second step is the betrothal step. That's exactly where we are in Matthew 1, where Joseph and Mary are in the Christmas story. This lasted for about a year. And the betrothal step in the Jewish community, in the eyes of the Jewish community, they are married. In fact, they were married legally, with the exception that they were not to have intimate relationship. Now, in verse 19, it says, Joseph, her husband. So you see that there is the betrothal step. They were uh, uh, betrothed. <laughs> then you espouse, and then you have that they were husband and wife, uh, but they did not come together in intimacy. If the man died during this period of betrothal, they would look on the woman as a widow. They would call her a virgin widow. If you wanted to back out of the betrothal, you had to get a divorce, the right of divorce. And then the third step is the actual marriage, and that's that, that week-long celebration that most people are uh, familiar with even today. And so the scene picks up during the betrothal period, but then something seriously bad happens. That will spark rumors. It'll spark gossip. What happens, verse 18? She, Mary, is found with child. So notice in your notes there, Joseph's discovery of Mary's baby. Though engaged... Joseph and Mary did not live with each other, yet here she is, expecting a baby. How do you explain that? Imagine the dinner conversation when Mary says to her parents, Father, Mother, I need to tell you something. A few months ago, I was out fetching water at the well, and this man appeared to me that was glowing like an angel. It, Mom, Dad, Abba, it was an angel. And he said, you're going to be the mother of the Messiah. What do you think they thought? <laughs> Though Mary's parents would be super honored to be the grandparents of the Messiah, I'm sure they had a hard time believing her story, wouldn't you? I mean, this has never happened in the history of the world. It's not possible. You know, if you go to Nazareth today, there's actually a, a church over a well where they believe this announcement took place. Soon the whole town would be talking. Soon the whole town would be asking, can you believe it? Mary's going to have a baby. Uh, they're not yet married. They haven't taken that third step. Could Joseph be the father? I thought he was such a good man. I thought he was such a godly man. Think of the embarrassment for Joseph. Think of the embarrassment for Joseph's parents. Think of the embarrassment for Mary's parents. What a conversation that once, once Joseph and Mary talked it over. I wonder if he said things like, Mary, Mary, I love you. Mary, I want to believe you. I just don't understand what you are telling me. It's just impossible. And then notice Joseph's dilemma over Mary's baby. Verse 19, being a just man, not willing to make her a public example, is minded to put her away privately. That's privately, quietly. He asked, do I marry her or should I divorce her? And so he, he, he decides to quietly divorce her to kind of shield her from public shame. Deuteronomy chapter 20 verse 1 allowed uh, for a writing of divorcement under Old Testament law. He may have wondered, did she commit adultery? But that makes no sense because she's a godly woman. She would never violate her, her, her vow of purity. Maybe she was raped. Well, if that happened, then why wouldn't she have told me? And so what could he do? 
And as he is thinking about a private divorce, notice number three, Joseph's dream about Mary's baby. Verse 20, while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appears to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. And so the angel gives this explanation. The dream means a vision while you were asleep. And when the angel said, Joseph, <coughs> son of David, do you know what's happening here? God is fulfilling a Bible prophecy that, that Messiah will be a descendant of David. Do you remember the town where David is from? Where's that? Bethlehem. And so when Caesar Augustus, all the way back there in Rome, made a decree that all the world should be taxed, that included the Jewish people, he willingly submitted to the providence of God because God needed to get a, 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 a young married couple from Nazareth way up north to go all the way down south to a tiny little town of Bethlehem because the prophet Micah predicted in Bethlehem, out of Judah, will Messiah be born. What a relief he must have felt when the angel said, you can take Mary to be your wife. Though Joseph is not the biological father of Jesus, by marriage he would give Jesus the true legal status because he was of the house and lineage of David. Luke chapter 2 and verse 4. Notice the instruction. The father is responsible for naming the child. And so notice uh, in verse 21, <coughs> And she shall bring forth a son. Thou shalt call his name Jesus. Joseph, you will call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. What a great name, Jesus. Jehovah saves. God saves. That's Jesus' name. And so the Lord instructed Joseph that he would name the child, and he would name it him Jesus and he did verse 25 and he Joseph called his name Jesus showing his obedience notice the revelation we find here verse 23 the Bible says in verse 22 spoken by the prophet this is Isaiah 23 behold a virgin shall be with child and shall bring forth a son and they shall call his name Emmanuel which being interpreted as God with us Isaiah 7:14, 7, 700 years before Jesus was born the prophecy is given of what his name will be that he'll be ver uh, born of a virgin and then notice Joseph's decision about Mary's baby in verse 24, Joseph being raised from sleep did as the angel of the Lord had bidden him, and he took unto him his wife and knew her not until she had brought forth her firstborn son and called his name he, Joseph called his name Jesus. Imagine the next day after he had that dream. Imagine the next day at the break of dawn, he gets up early and he goes, he goes to Mary's house. Maybe he gets a few pebbles or rocks and he's, he's throwing them against the door, maybe against the window. Psst, Mary, Psst, Mary, Mary, come out here. And he made a ruckus out there until finally Mary came out. And, and what does he say? He says, oh, Mary, I, I want you to know that I believe you with every, I wanted to believe you with every fiber of my being, but I just couldn't understand it. But now I know, Mary, an angel, an angel came to me in a dream and explained it all. Mary, we're going to be married. I don't care what the village says. I don't care what the family says. We love God. God loves us. And we're going to please him. We're going to be the parents of the Messiah. Chosen by God to be Jesus' adopted father. And so he plays a magnificent role in the life of Jesus. And so the question is, why? Why Joseph? Why pick him? Why Joseph? Well, because, first of all, of his relationship with God. Verse 19, he is a just man. A just man, he is a, a righteous man. He is a believer. He is an Old Testament believer. You say, but we're in the New Testament. John the Bapt Jesus said, uh, the law and the prophets are until John, John the Baptist. So like Abraham, he believes by faith, and he is justified. He did not want to break God's law, and so he had this dilemma before the angel came, can I please God and still go through with this wedding? You know, the closest people to us most often test our relationship to God. They test our commitment with them 
and they test our commitment to God. Remember when God asked Abraham to offer Isaac as a sacrifice. Biggest test of his life. Biggest test of his faith. And his allegiance to God was tested, and he said yes to God. Why Joseph? Well, because of his relationship to God, but also because of his attitude toward Mary. He treated her very well. We know that he desired to protect her. He could have been the cause of her losing her life, Deuteronomy 22. It was still a punishable offense to have a child out of wedlock. This is not a time when women were equals, not at all. It was truly a man's world. Yet his attitude towards Mary is beautiful. Our actions do not show our maturity in the faith as much as our reactions. What happens to us when what we want to do just falls apart? Maybe it's something we don't like. Maybe it's something we don't understand. Maybe it's something against our preference. Maybe it's something that upsets us. And our reaction in that moment reveals our spiritual maturity. You know, Joseph could have had all kind of reactions, couldn't he? He could have thought, how, how could she do this to me? He could have wondered, I, I wonder who the fellow was. But his reaction towards Mary is truly magnificent. Most people think, how is this going to affect me? He could have thought, my goodness, people who live in this little town are going to think, I broke God's law. Mary's parents, what are they going to be thinking? Oh, everybody's going to wonder, what kind of a child did we raise? And the normal reaction is, how is this going to affect me? Normal reaction. Joseph's reaction, how is this going to affect Mary, the person that I really love? Nothing is more revealing about our maturity than the way we respond to situations that are not positive towards those we love. Back in the early days when, when I had begun the church in the 1980s, I, I attended a counseling conference hosted by Dr. Jay Adams. He's now with the Lord. He is the, the pioneer biblical, uh, author of biblical counseling, writing more than 100 books. And as he sat in a, a chair on the platform, rocking back and forth, he explained how to be able to counsel married couples. And he said something I'll never forget. He said, he said, you watch how a man speaks to his wife in public or in the counseling office. And any negative words, any bad attitudes, any anger that you see, you multiply that by 10, and that is how he treats her in private men of all the people on God's green earth that you need to show respect to it's your wife and all the women said amen, amen. All right. <laughs> you're with me you're listening it's good and if you're single it's every girl that you ever date God commands that a husband is to love his wife the same way that Christ loves his church. It is the husband's responsibility to spoil his wife, rotten with extravagant love. Try it. Sacrifice yourself for the one whom you said, I do. Joseph did. Joseph did. Can you imagine the love and appreciation Mary had for Joseph when they got back to Nazareth? I mean, this is the man who stood by me. This is the man who believed in me. This is the man who cared for me, who loved me when my family didn't believe me, my friends didn't believe me, the, uh, the town didn't believe me, but he did. Do you think Joseph and Mary had a good marriage? Oh, I do. I do. Why Joseph? Because of his relationship to God, because of his attitude towards Mary, and, and then let her see, because of his sensitivity to God's will. How sensitive are you to God's will? Are you willing to change? Are you willing to submit to God's command and to God's direction? Are you willing to change? You say, Pastor, don't you know, you can't teach an old dog new tricks. You're not a dog. 
You're a child of God. And since you're a child of God and you come to the church of God and the Spirit of God lives in you and you got the Word of God, you can change. You can become more like Jesus Christ and you can put off the old habits and put on some new habits with God's help. Are you willing to make sacrifices in your life to be more like Christ? Joseph is sensitive to God's will. He's willing to change. It's hard to be sensitive to to God's will when you've already made your own plans. Joseph already made his plans. Uh, he had a plan. I got a plan to get married. I got a plan to be able to have children. I got a plan to be able to, uh, if I have any boys, to be able to teach them carpentry and they'll work with me. <coughs> got a plan to be able to live an orderly, ordinary life. That's my plan. And then all of a sudden, my plan is shattered. What am I going to do? All of a sudden, God breaks into his life and says, Joseph, let me tell you about my plan. I have a different plan than what you have. My pl I'd like you to turn all of your plans around and be able to follow my plan. Joseph, I want you to choose my plan. It's hard to be sensitive to God's will when you've already made your plans. It's hard to be sensitive to God's will when you are emotionally involved with the problem. Joseph is going to lose the one he loves. His emotions are tied to the problem. You know, there are several ways you can lose the person you love. You can lose the person you love because of anger. You can lose the person you love because of violence. You can lose the person you love because of adultery. You can lose the person you love because of, of divorce. How many violent acts, even murder, are committed every day in our country because of a love relationship that has gone bad? I, I want you to know that Christ can restore that which is broken. He can restore that which is broken. It's hard to be sensitive to God's will, thirdly, when God's plan doesn't make any sense. You cannot make sense out of the Christmas story. You think through the details of the Christmas story. Any human author sitting down, given the task to write out the story of the birth of God's Son from heaven, it wouldn't look anything like this. Not at all. Makes no sense. We just have to accept it as God's beautiful story. And it is. It's not going to make sense to Joseph but he's going to trust, and he's going to believe, and he's going to obey. Hey, has God interrupted your life and your plans? Think back when you were younger, or maybe you think you're still young. Uh, think back when you're younger, and you say, oh, yeah, this is my plan, this is what I plan to do, and then all of a sudden it takes a twist and a turn, and it looks nothing like what you had planned. My life didn't go as planned. I, I mean, I went from a typical family when I was very young to a single-parent family to a blended family, to an alcoholic family, to a safe family, and that all happened in 15 years. And so by the time I'm 15, I got it all figured out now. I want to be a pilot. I, I, I want to graduate high school. I want to go into the Air Force Academy. I want to become a career pilot. I want to serve my country that way. That's not how it worked out, did it? God had a different plan. It did not make any sense for a teen boy who is fearfully afraid of public speaking to surrender to preach God's word in front of people. Are you willing to surrender your plans for God's better plan? Why, Joseph? Why did God choose a carpenter? He needed a man who was sturdy and stable and practical yet sensitive to the voice of God. He needed someone who would stand with a young virgin who others would ridicule. Joseph was strong, but he was compassionate. He would love and encourage the mother of Jesus. Joseph as the man of the house, think about this. Joseph as the man of the house is going to be the first one to teach the little boy Jesus about God. He's teaching God about God. Think of that. He's teaching him about the law of God, about the written word. He's teaching him how to pick up a hammer and a saw, how to nail and how to be able to, 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 to fashion stone and wood. 
He's teaching the one to use his little hands to build things. I mean, these, these are the hands of the, man, of the being who created the world. Joseph, Joseph in humility, when he goes to Jerusalem, when the boy was just 12 years old, it became evident that his first allegiance is to another father, to a heavenly father. And Joseph was humble enough to, to silently step back and let God the Father step forward. One of the most important lessons from the life of Joseph is this. The most important thing in the world can happen to the least important people in the world. The king of kings, the Lord of lords, can take up residence inside the lives of ordinary people. The greatest somebody who ever lived came to nobodies like Joseph and Mary and like you and me. Isn't this the very attitude that God requires from us? Lord, God, just tell me what to do and I will do it. I will be obedient anytime, anywhere, at any cost. I'll do anything for you. If you say it, I will, I will do it. A British college student was having a good time in England. He was studying engineering. And in his spare time, he would ride his motorcycle all over the English countryside. On a cold and rainy night, he crashed his motorcycle and he lay injured on a remote road for many hours. By the time he was found and hospitalized, pneumonia had set in. The doctors came to him and they said, you have but two weeks to live. During those two weeks, a letter arrived from his father, who was a missionary in Angola. The letter written months before finally arrived by ship. And he opened the letter there on what was to be his deathbed, and he read his father's first words. Only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. And these words so stabbed his heart that he, he pulled himself out of the bed with all the strength that he had, and he, he kneeled down to pray, and he said, Lord, you have won. I now own you as my king. I now own you as my Lord. If you heal my body, I will serve you anywhere, anytime, at any cost. Well, that teen college student recovered, and he went on to become a powerful pastor and evangelist there in England and touched the world. Now with the Lord, his name was Stephen Olford. God brought him to a place of great usefulness through the tragedy of an accident, but most of all through the willingness to say, Anywhere, anytime, at any cost. His biography is titled Only One Life. It's Joseph. Joseph. When Joseph received the angel's message, he, he, he walked away from what made sense to do what God asked him to do, and he said, Anywhere, anytime, at any cost. Are we willing to say that today? Are we willing to be like Joseph? Lord, I will serve you anywhere, at any time, at any cost. Long ago, that was Joseph on the road to Bethlehem from Nazareth. And today, it is, it is your roadmap for spiritual victory to be surrendered to God's best for your life. Oh, what a happy day when, when you and I surrender to believe and obey God in every area of our life. Even though I might not understand everything that God is doing, God reserves the right to be able to, to give us what we need to know when we need to know it and reveal the rest in his time. Do you see that in your life? You take one step, you don't quite understand it, then God gives you the next step and then the next step. Some of the most exciting things that will ever happen to you is when you say yes to God even before you fully know what you are saying yes to. It's that step of faith. And as you take the step of faith, God will unfold this marvelous plan for your life day by day, week after week, and then year after year. But you have to say yes. 
You have to take the step. Think of what happened because of the obedience of Joseph and Mary. Here we are, Christmas 2022. Because of what they did, God has made it possible for each one of us to be able to trust in Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. And I do pray that if you are not yet saved, that today you would put your faith and trust in him. You can choose to follow Christ today. You can choose to receive the gift of the forgiveness of all of your sins today. Don't wait. May we pray. Father, thank you. Thank you for this man, Joseph. Thank you for the example that he is to each one of us to be able to be willing to do what you would have him to do, whether it be difficult or not, anywhere, anytime, at any cost, to say yes to God. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed as we come into God's presence. I want to ask you today, have you made that commitment to become a true and genuine follower of Christ do you remember the time that you said yes to God in salvation that you cannot be good enough to get to heaven by your own good works or baptism or sacraments if you can remember a time and a place maybe not the date where you chose to become a true Christian a follower of Christ you have a Bible reason to know that you're going to heaven you're trusting in Christ alone. Would you simply raise your hand all over our congregation today? God bless you. You may put your hands down. You say, Pastor, I, I think I'm saved. I hope I'm saved. But I have doubts. I'm just not sure. God brought you here today. God brought you online to this worship service today that you might know for certain that heaven is your home. If you sense the Spirit of God tugging at your heart, you feel the conviction of sin. Only Christ can save you. Would you reach out to him today? Would you say, Pastor, I want to be saved today. I want to receive Christ today. Would you simply raise your hand? Anyone at all, I would like to turn to Christ and be saved today. Anyone at all, just hold your hand up for a moment. Christian, may I ask you, does the life of Joseph speak to your heart? Are you willing to surrender to do God's plan instead of your preferred plan? Are you willing to say yes to God during this time of invitation him? Would you allow God to have his way in your life? Maybe it's someone you need to forgive. Grant forgiveness whether they ask for it or not. Maybe it's bringing some discipline into your life, some order to be faithful in church and, and faithful in the you, word of God and prayer and giving I've and sharing your faith with others. Maybe it's time Lord to find a place to serve that in 2023 that you'll be a servant of God because you'll have a place to serve. Would you say yes to Christ? Lord, I need you. Oh, I need you. Every hour I need you, my one defense, my righteousness, oh God, how I need you. Our Father, we, we praise you today for your loving care for each one of us, this wonderful plan that you have for all of us. Lord, teach us to trust in you, to lean upon you, to acknowledge you, that you might direct our path, that we might bring glory to you by the things we say, by the things we do, that we'll live our lives in a way that truly honor Christ. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Amen.